Edgeless Horseman here. I thought I'd make a video about the current gold rush in the Bendigo zone down in uh, Victoria, Australia, and uh, primarily around uh, the Foster Wheel mine. And uh, give some context to uh, Novo's recent stakes in Kalamazoo and uh, GBM Metals uh, or GBM Gold. Uh, well, first off, uh, this is the Bendigo zone, the light blue stuff here, and uh, this is primarily where people are hunting for the next Bendigo mine or Foster Wheel mine, and uh, this is basically a cross section of how it looks uh, down here. Uh, this is a stable zone, and this is the Bendigo zone, and uh, you can see some really deep seated projected faults that go up to foster wheel and and reach bendigo etc and here we have the coster field mine uh, that's in the melbourne zone uh, but it's primarily the gold rush is primarily uh, located around this area and to give some additional context uh, the government of australia or i guess the Victorian government uh, has done a, some good videos on the uh, Foster Wheel area uh, in light of them releasing uh, tenements uh, that should be announced pretty soon who gets them. But anyway, let's start with uh, uh, a clip from one of their presentations. The other thing about seismic, it gives you a great idea of where things are going at depth and starts to allow you to test ideas. So this is a Heathcote fault zone in central Victoria. These Cambrian oceanic volcanics thrust to the surface on a fault. Where do they go? Well, the seismic shows they go right down there. It's a really coherent fault size. So we, when we map it, it looks coherent for 140 kilometres of length. And now the seismic shows it just heads on down and stays coherent right down into the lower crust. In fact, you can trace it from surface where we can map it to the Moho, which is deep as you can use seismic to image. This is, that's 40 kilometres deep. So this is the scale of these systems. It is fully crustal scale. And so we can take our surface understanding and extend it down to look at rocks that have the same character and density. So you can model these rocks using gravity, which is work Phil Skledgen did, where he took the densities we've measured from the volcanics and sediments, compared them, and validated our seismic interpretation. Now, what's significant about this is that these are the rocks that we think could be a potential gold source. And this new work shows that gold fluids out of these rocks doesn't have to be efficient. It could be 0.1% efficient. It will still explain the world-class endowment because we've got literally thousands of cubic kilometres of these rocks stuffed down there at the depths where they've metamorphosed and exolved fluids. That's Bendigo, that's Fosterville. We'll talk about that in a minute. With geological understanding, for example, that's our shape from the seismic, this is estimations that Dave Gray and co-workers did using fossils in the turbidites to constrain how shortened they've been and then undoing that deformation. Now we understand the whole system's thick skinned, we can apply this template to the whole crust and wind it back through time to see what it looked like and actually unfold it right back to an ocean basin. Now that's in cross-section, what's that look like in plan? Well it's really about taking the Bendigo zone and just unfolding it and when you do that it moves a lot of Victoria a long way away. This, this was an ocean basin prior to the orogenic goals belts deforming, and it was some sort of ocean basin with microcontinent stuck in it. Where did it go? Interesting question. Uh, so, as you saw in the video, uh, this Bendigo zone we have today uh, used to be a lot wi wider, and uh, it basically got uh, squished uh, into what we see today. And that uh, uh, and the theory is that uh, that led to uh, the heating of uh, low-grade rocks uh, deep in the ground that then, I guess, exhaled gold-bearing fluids all the way from, uh, yeah, I guess, the Moho line down here. Uh, basically heated up this rock package. Uh, and uh, then transported gold bearing fluids up to surface uh, where they formed uh, deposits such as the 22 million ounce Bendigo and the uh, Foster Wheel uh, mine. And uh, an interesting thing is that, I mean, 
Foster Will isn't really a new discovery. Uh, as you see, uh, this, I guess, light green or magenta or whatever. These are all open pits, uh, historic open pits. They are found along the Foster Will trend. And uh, this uh, light brown stuff is uh, uh, the underground deposit, uh, the current underground deposit, which you can see here. So basically, uh, the Foster Will mine or trend of mines started out as, uh, I guess, mediocre near surface open pits, and uh, then it took until a few years ago uh, to realize that the gold actually uh, goes a lot deeper and the uh, grades in some areas just explodes uh, as is evidenced by the swan zone uh, which is I guess one of the richest uh, deposits in the world or richest zones at least um, so I mean there's obviously potential for there being more underground gold uh, just based on the number of open pits along this uh, I think it's around nine kilometer long trend of abandoned workings and open pits uh, well let's have a look at what uh, Kalamazoo has uh, they've also got a lot of historic workings and uh, uh, major faults and and uh, uh, multiple reefs etc and you can see histor historic gold workings that's the yellow dots I mean they're scattered all over the place especially here uh, and here are some uh, legacy drilling uh, drill intercepts uh, and you can see there are some really high grade hits in here uh, 0.6 meters of 500 grams 5 meters of 10 grams 2.5 meters of uh, 70 grams, uh, 0.78 meters of 156, and recently Kalamazoo has um, uh, hit a very narrow intersection of, I think it was plus 1000 grams per ton. Uh, this is also a slide I like, it's from a, a previous presentation by Kalamazoo where they show uh, gold production in uh, millions of ounces uh, in the Bendigo zone and the uh, Bendigo mine or mines they were uh, they are the largest ones in terms of endowment uh, as of today still and the 4 million ounces came from alluvial gold and 18 million ounces came from uh, reef gold and Bellrat had 7.6 million ounces of alluvial gold and 2.5 million ounces of uh, reef gold and then you have Casma which has 4.7 million ounces of uh, alluvial gold and only 0.9 uh, million ounces were mined in reefs and uh, uh, then you take that in the context of okay where what depth have uh, these uh, different uh, the, uh, systems been mined. Uh, Casamine is only, I, th I think there are only a few uh, drill holes that go beneath 500 meters or something and as you can see I mean Bendigo uh, mined up to 1000 meters plus same with Ballarat and we know that Foster Will is down to I don't know 1.5 kilometers or something and uh, again, what is interesting is the amount of uh, alluvial gold in, in such a relatively small area. Uh, as you can see here, for example, from a, uh, GBN, a GBM uh, news release. And this is the Castleman gold field, uh, 4.7 million ounces, and this is the Bendigo area, 4 million ounces. And Ballrat had more, but uh, that's a much larger gold field, uh, which is interesting. And this is the uh, small claim that GBM Resources has. And here you can see 
uh, surface workings uh, and uh, here you can also see alluvial so I mean there's a lot of gold uh, that's been drained from structures in this uh, relatively small area uh, and also notice the magnetic high here uh, and they ask the question is this a buried intrusive um, which we'll come back to later uh, but anyway I mean the main point uh, is that the, the areas where you have historic workings etc I mean now uh, with the discovery of uh, Swanson etc we know that uh, we know that uh, there can be a lot of high grade gold hiding under these uh, shallow workings and both uh, GBM resources and Kalamazoo has a lot of uh, historic workings at surface and we know there's high grade gold at depth um, this slide is pretty interesting as well it's from the Mal Malmsbury uh, project GBM and here you can say, you see that uh, it's a longitudinal section and this is where it seems they did the most drilling but you can see I mean there's mines and shafts and mines scattered along a two kilometer trend here and uh, I mean take this area for example uh, only 98,000 98, tons of ore uh, were reported to be mined and it had a grade of 29 grams per ton so I mean uh, just shy of 100,000 tons of ore uh, and they were able to basically produce 91,000 ounces of gold from that. So, I mean, that's obviously super rich. Uh, you don't need a lot of... Uh, you don't need a lot of tonnage to uh, get a gold, uh, nice gold deposit. And uh, what's also interesting that uh, we know in a recent podcast, uh, Quinton said that uh, they were focusing in an area that he wouldn't uh, basically think was the best target. Uh, he said uh, basically the middle or the center of the d district is where he would be, uh, where he would go look. Uh, I'm not sure if that means center here or center along this trend where you have the uh, basically yeah super high grades. Uh, because th this is a news release, an update from GBM. I think it was done by Stephen Nano, which I know both um, Quinton and uh, Brent Cook thinks highly of. Uh, and here is a uh, some uh, yeah ba basically some comments on on the historic mining. Incomplete records show smaller scale but a very high gold, uh, high grade gold production from the belt topper gold field with uh, average production grades of 87.5 grams per ton and 64.8 grams per ton for the Panman belt topper tunnel mines. And that's, I think, uh, here it says belt topper crown and here's the Panman shaft. So I guess that's uh, here basically, uh, or here perhaps. Uh, yeah, I think that's here. So is that the center of the district? I don't know, either here or there. And it continues. Uh, there are a few production records from this. Oh, no. The longest line of workings in the bell topper field is the 450 meter long missing link line. There are a few production records from these workings. So a record of early batches of production of near surface. Uh, or average approximately 180 grams per ton. So I mean that's obviously super high. That's like uh, Swanson numbers. Uh, uh, yeah, even beyond that, if it would be the true average. Uh, uh, and here's also a slide. Uh, Bendigo uh, is a much more nuggety system, but that's. Uh, also, one of the reasons is probably because it uh, was formed in um, deeper underground in a mesozoanal zone. Uh, and uh, foster oil is, uh, was created at a shallower level. Um, 
as well as uh, Malmsbury. It's it's believed to be that uh, anyway. And there are some other similarities similarities between the Foster Wheel mine and the uh, Malmsbury deposit, which sets them apart from uh, Bendigo. And here is a list basically where they compare Bendigo, Foster Wheel, and Malmsbury, uh, which is Malmsbury again is the G GBM Resources project, which NOVO has uh, basically uh, put in an option to acquire 75% of the project. Um, here are some different characteristics. Uh, here, for example, depth of formation. Uh, Bendigo is believed to have been formed at a depth of 8 to 12 kilometers, and it would be a mesozoonal. Uh, Organic gold deposit and the age is 450 million uh, years ago. And Foster Will and Malmesbury are believed to have formed in uh, on in shallow levels 2.6 to 5.7 kilometers for Foster Will and Malmesbury even shallower at 1 uh, to 2.5 kilometers. And you can see the, the age or Quite similar and it sets them apart a bit at least from the more nuggety Bendigo mine um, and this is also believed uh, to coincide with uh, as it states here uh, fossil oil and Mansbury system sort of similar age and 70 to se uh, 60 to 70 million years younger than the Bendigo system and the age of fossil oil and Mansbury mineralization overlaps with the emplacement of late Devonian granite to granite di diorite. So the thinking is basically or, or as far as I understand um, Bendigo is more of a true orogenic gold system. Um, uh, one second. Uh, th that formed earlier when I guess uh, this old Bendigo song got squashed. But uh, a few tens of million years later, uh, late Devonian granite uh, intruded this area, which uh, is believed to have created, uh, I mean, a, a heat source and possibly even more gold bearing fluid. So uh, basically, Foster will seems to have an overprint uh, that it has both uh, organic gold and intrusion related uh, gold and that uh, and that's the same for Malmsbury I mean uh, at least according to the findings because the the ore characteristics uh, are very similar between Foster Will and Malmsbury and here you can see for example, I mean, they, they have a map what they believe is uh, a, perhaps a buried intrusive. So, I mean, that would be uh, possibly a, a heat source and, and uh, possibly, I mean, a, a source for additional gold. And what is interesting is that uh, this little outline here, you can see, I mean, there's a gap between the Kalamazoo Castle main project and the... Uh, uh, Malmesbury project but uh, lately or I think it popped up in January in a presentation by Kalamazoo that they have uh, made an application for this gap area here and uh, I think it goes something like this as well so basically um, basically they're, they're uh, no has staked uh, or optioned 75% of this claim and we have a stake in Kalamazoo, obviously, which already has all this stuff and all this stuff. And here is the GBM resources claim. And yeah, here is the Queen's application. So basically, uh, Kalamazoo is, uh, has uh, made an application to acquire some additional ground that surrounds... Uh, the Malmesbury project. So I mean, there's. It's obviously. I mean, th those are some hints. I would say. Uh, and uh, yeah, this is uh, quite interesting as well. Uh, here you get the fossil mine, which is I don't know eight million ounces or so. Uh, 
in terms of gold produced and uh, reserves and resources. Uh, here's the uh, Bendigo area where there was 22 million ounces produced and it's the largest uh, gold field known to date. And the red lines uh, is what separates the Bendigo zone from uh, the Stavel zone and, and the Melbourne zone. So here is Kalamazoo's tenements. And uh, this little thing here is basically uh, Malmesbury, the Malmesbury project owned by GBM Resources. And if we put on the historic mining activity filter, it gets kind of interesting. So obviously there's a lot of activity in the Bendigo zone here. Um, and uh, fossil wheel has, you can see a few of the open pits, etc. show up. Uh, but uh, I mean, the second highest concentration is uh, here around Castlemaine. And there's also a cluster around here uh, near, near and at the Malmesbury project and then we can add mines and mineral occurrences. Okay, so there, it, it's pretty obvious that uh, Kalamazoo controls the, li the lion's share of, of uh, um, the highest concentration of uh, historic workings, etc. And again, I mean, this hasn't been tested at depth, so I mean, the, the Obviously, the theory is that, like Foster Will, uh, these reefs might go a lot deeper and uh, might turn into even higher grades. And you uh, can also click on the mineral regions. And, and, and this basically confirms with the, where is it? Uh, yeah, with the gold fields you can see here. Uh, and these are the claims that are, are being tendered right now. And, and I think we will, uh, I mean, the rumors suggest that uh, we will know who the owners are to these claims uh, before April is over. Um, so that can shane, uh, shake things up a lot. Uh, especially, I mean, I, I'm not exactly sure what, would be the hottest claims, but I uh, I think Kalamazoo has uh, made an offer on two of them, and I would just guess that they're uh, uh, centered around the Foster Wheel mine. And another thing is that the green stuff you see here is uh, the Murray Basin cover. So the ones that have claims uh, where you have this green stuff, uh, they don't really have any surface outcrop. So I mean, there there might be a lot of gold to the north i mean probably is and at least according to the victorian government i believe there's tens of millions of, uh, of ounces hidden under cover of course the problem is that it gets more expensive to explore and it's harder to explore because you don't have uh, surface working etc because the uh, mineralization doesn't really reach the surface so that that's another uh, point i like uh, about Kalamazoo and GBM because they're located where there is no cover up basically so and that's why you can basically I mean the, the old timers have already helped to delineate where there's gold bearing structures uh, around so I mean but but I, I assume that this area would be pretty attractive to acquire and you can see there are some surface working etc along here and I mean uh, even though they're not lighting up as much as the Bendigo and Castlemaine area uh, we know now that there is a thing called the fossil wheel mine that um, I mean started off pretty humble uh, but turned into one of the absolutely best mines in the world which generated like a billion in cash free cash flow or something uh, a year or two ago so i mean th that's obviously worth billions as we know so i mean the the price if you would find one of these foster will lookalikes is obviously huge because that's a tier one mine and uh, 
I mean, if you listen to Quinton, um, he think he thinks that uh, there's a good chance that uh, if Kalamazoo and GBM uh, start drilling at depth, I mean, there's a good chance that uh, all the mineralization you see at the surface and some is bonanza grade already. Uh, could continue to depth over a kilometer, etc. So I mean, there's there's obviously a lot of room to run, and uh, I own shares of Kalamazoo. Uh, I don't own shares of GBM. I might buy some. I'm not sure yet. Um, and I obviously own shares of Noel. Um, and I'm not a geologist, so I mean, uh, I'm not an investment advisor either. So. Take everything I just said with a grain of salt, uh, but I but I'm pretty I'm pretty excited what uh, this whole venture might turn into. Uh, say within twelve to twenty four months, because by then we should have been able to drill quite a bit, and just the fact that uh, uh, the Malmesbury area uh, has characteristics that so closely resembles Foster Wheel is exciting and then add the fact that the chasm main area is loaded with gold I mean obviously there's something going on here if you can have 4.7 million ounces basically uh, of alluvial gold in this little area and uh, again Bendigo turned out to be 22 million ounces uh so i mean there's a lot of depth potential here and uh, these are some of the best exploration place i know of currently again always do your own due diligence uh thanks for listening bye bye